Good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, Don't really have any announcements this morning other than it's sure a nice day. Another another nice day that we have. Um, So our opening hymn this morning is number 741, Thy Holy Wings. I invite you to join with me as we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We confess our faith with the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Genesis 1. And, you know, the the Revised Common Lectionary sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If I was doing it, I would have had this reading last week with John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But they don't do it that way. So today we read uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, and empty darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Here ends our first reading. Our second reading is from the book of Acts. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. 
There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Here ends our second reading. Our gospel reading for this morning is from Mark 1, verses 4 through 11. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable standing. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. As I thought about this reading, you know, uh, not just the reading, but, but Jesus being baptized by John. And I'm one like many people throughout all of the ages. In the early fourth century, there were a lot of scholars that were saying that, you know, it just isn't right that Jesus was baptized with this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And since he was baptized that way, he, he must not have been the sinless son of God. So there was a lot of dissent about Jesus being the son of God if he had gone through this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins that John was proclaiming. And... Um, and it, it just doesn't make sense to me always, you know, when I think about that. You know, if you're being baptized for the repentance of sins, Jesus wouldn't have needed that. Because we believe, teach, and trust that he was the sinless son of God. He is the sinless son of God. But when I think more and more about that text and, and Jesus being baptized, uh, I look at it and I think that as Jesus came up out of the waters, the Bible tells us that the heavens were torn open and the Spirit descended on them like a dove. You know, the Spirit of God came like this dove. And in my mind, I picture this bird sitting on Jesus' shoulder, you know. I mean, I don't know what you do, but that's what I picture or on his head or something. But I think more real than that is that this Spirit of God, it, it's like, you know, in, in the reading from Acts, that when these people were baptized into the name of Jesus and Paul placed his hands on them. It says the Holy Spirit came into them. So I think that the Spirit of God descending like a dove just didn't light on Jesus, but it became a part of him within him. And then as we read on in the gospel, it says that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness or compelled him or led him, different words that way. But this Spirit of God came more fully into Jesus at that time. Jesus had been living as, as a man on this earth. He was a carpenter following in his father's footsteps. But yet within all of that, he still knew that he was the son of God. And his mom knew it for sure because she kept kind of encouraging. We can read so many different times in the Bible. But at his baptism, as he came out of the waters, the spirit enters into him, becomes a, more of a part of him. And he hears this affirmation, this voice from heaven, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. We hear almost identical words spoken that way from heaven, 
when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain of transfiguration, where, he, where he's transfigured just shortly before his arrest and his death on the cross. Jesus is having a conversation with Moses and Elijah up there on that mountain, and the voice comes from heaven again. And Peter, James, and John hear this voice. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So I think that in this baptism of Jesus, that you know, the Spirit came more fully into him, and he became more fully aware of what it meant for him to be the Son of God. And as he went out into the wilderness for the temptations and for the, for the learning process, I think, is where he became more aware, more fully aware, of what it meant for him to be a child of God, to be baptized, to have the Holy Spirit come within him. And I think that also leads us to the end of Matthew's gospel where Jesus says, you know, go into all nations, baptizing and teaching, or teaching and, and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all I have commanded you. So I think about Jesus at his baptism and how the Holy Spirit came to him. And I think about my baptism. I mean, how many of you think about your baptism on a regular basis? No. I mean, you know, it's something that happened a long time ago. I mean, I was born on August 19th, 1953. I celebrate, I observe that birthday every year. I know that date very well. I was baptized on November 8th, 1953. It was a Sunday. One of my classmates was baptized on Saturday, November 7th, 1953. I know that because of the church records of our Savior's Lutheran in McHenry. And I know that it wasn't uncommon for a family to come in to the parsonage or to the church any day of the week and have the whole family would be baptized. And I know families growing up that that happened, you know, in my, some of my friends that way. So I was baptized on November 8th, 1953. I wasn't quite three months old yet. I mean, did I know what was going on? No. But my mom and my dad and my baptismal sponsors, Norvin and Phyllis and Russ and Erna, stood up in front of the congregation and said to the pastor's questions, do you promise to bring this child up in faith and to teach him the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, bring him to worship, put a Bible in his hands? And they said, yup. And the congregation affirmed that. And the congregation did that. And I have a Bible at home that was given to me by Norvin and Phyllis. It's a zippered King James Version, the old truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you. And, and so I don't read that Bible very much, but I treasure it because it was given to me by those people, by two of those people that stood up and said, I will take part in this young man's life of faith growing up. So I was baptized. Don't remember that at all. But what I do remember about the result of my baptism is that on May 5th, 1967, I was confirmed in my faith. I was affirmed. You know, we talk about confirmation service. It's the affirmation of our baptism. And on that day, I sat up in the choir loft in Our Saviors and along with my classmates. And Pastor Norm said, Russ, what's the meaning of the third article of the Apostles' Creed? And I started out, you know. And I got partway through there and I, I just stopped because I had to think. And, and Pastor Norm says, will you finish that for him? You know, asked him, and just boom, you know, there it was. But on that day, I affirmed my baptism. And I said to God and to all the people that were there that, you know, when the pastor asked me and my confirmation classmates, do you promise, do you intend to continue coming to worship? Do you intend to continue studying the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments? Do you intend to be living in your baptism? And we said, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. That was the response, and that's still the response that, that we use. I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. As we, as we come to that point in our lives of this affirmation of baptism, there are congregations that dedicate their youth when they're babies, and then as you come to an age of reason, be it 14 or 20 or whatever age it might be, that you might be baptized. I know people that have talked with me that have been baptized two or three times. I've had people, friends of mine, 
who have been Lutheran all of their lives ask and just say, you know, I've been thinking and wondering if I should be baptized again. And, you know, it, it's in our Lutheran tradition, you know, one baptism is good for all time. We don't need a second baptism. But that's the affirmation that we have when we are, you know, 14, 15, whatever, after we've gone to confirmation. We are saying yes then to those promises. And I've told people, you know, if you, if you want to be rebaptized, if you think it would be important for you to be baptized, if it would be a good part of your faith journey to be rebaptized, um, we could do what's called the affirmation of a baptism. You know, if, if a child is born and there's question whether this child will live, you know, from the hospital, mom or dad or a nurse or anybody can baptize. And that's in our Lutheran tradition. Anybody can baptize. You don't have to be an ordained pastor. You don't have to be anybody special to baptize. It's, it's, it's the water and the word. And the word of God is what has the power. But if that happens, or when that happens, then we have an affirmation of baptism that we would have a public service in a church or whatever it might be. And so I've said to some of these adults that have asked me, you know, some of them 50 years old, about being baptized again. And, I, and I've said, we can do an affirmation of your baptism. And, you know, we can do all of the process through it if it's one of those things that will help you in your faith journey. I haven't had any say, yes, let's do that, because in our conversation, they come to that realization that when they were confirmed, unless they hadn't been confirmed, well, then, then we'll have some different conversation that way. But in the waters of our baptism, in the waters of my baptism, I truly and firmly believe that God didn't descend on me like a dove and say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, but God came and, and, and became more a part of me. He, he opened my mind to be able to better understand and better accept that Jesus is the living Son of God. That Jesus came and lived on this earth and he died on the cross for me and for my sins. And so that when I, when I read and I study the, you know, these, the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer and all of that, that I can more fully understand what it means when I say, Our Father who art in heaven that I'm coming to God as a loving parent, that I don't have to fear him, that I don't have to be worried that he's going to be so angry with me he won't forgive me. I mean, you guys have kids, right? Have you ever told your kids that, I just don't like you? No. I mean, what do we say to our kids? I love you. I mean, it doesn't matter. We may not be 100% pleased with it. We may, we may say to them some days, you are my son, my daughter, and I love you. But at this point in time, I'm not really pleased with you. <laughs> you know, we might do that. But we love him, regardless. And that's, that's God coming to us in our baptism, you know. And, and I know that there are days that, that God would probably, very, very probably say about me, to me, that, you know, I'm not super pleased today. But you are my child, and you are one that I love and cherish. And so when I think about baptism, I think about how it's God at work through the water, through the word. I mean, the water we use at baptism most of the time just comes right out of the kitchen sink, you know. I have friends that have imported water from the River Jordan or from someplace, you know, just for the baptism of their child. And I've, and I've wondered, you know, and I've thought about that, and I thought, that water that's in the Jordan River today, you know, where was that? when Jesus was baptized. Was it right there? Did they get to say water? I don't think so, because that water, when Jesus was baptized, you know, just five seconds later, that water was down the stream. So it isn't the water of the Jordan River. It isn't the water of anything else. And, and that's, you know, there's a, a story where, uh, of a baptism in the book of Acts that, you know, that, you know, well, can't I just be baptized in this river? Is, isn't this river better than the Jordan River? You know, does it make a difference? No. Does it make a difference what water we're using, where, the, where it is done? What matters is that it's the water and the Word of God. And that's the part of our two sacraments in our Lutheran faith, is the physical element, the water, or the bread and the wine, together with the Word of God. You know, it, and it's the Word of God that has the power to transform that water into this life-giving, cleansing water 
It's the word of God that has the power to, to change the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ, so that, as Martin Luther would say, the body and blood of Christ are present in, with, and through the bread and the wine as they come to us. And speaking of Martin Luther, you know that he was a monk. You know that he had struggles with his faith because of a lot of different things. And you can read, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, that when Martin Luther was having a particularly rough day and he felt the temptations of the devil, he would repeat over and over and over again, I am a baptized child of God. I am a baptized child of God. He, he knew that in his baptism, there was a changing that took place, that there was a strength that came, a strength of understanding, a strength of just being able to say no to the temptations of the devil. And just knowing that he was baptized enabled him to come to God more fully and, and more realistically, knowing that God heard his prayers. Knowing that it didn't always, I mean, it didn't matter what he did, that no matter what he did, God still loved him. And there are a lot of stories about Martin Luther that way, but, but baptism was important to him. That he was then, became a f f more fully a child of God. In Jesus' day, the Jewish tradition wasn't so much to be baptized. So when John came to the River Jordan and was teaching and preaching this baptism for the re of repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, it was a new thing. It was a new journey for these Jewish people to think that, you know, I'm no longer having to do all of this. If I can be baptized and repent and be forgiven, that was something new. And in Jesus Christ, God did something even more new, that he came to live among us, to live within us. And as Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. That same Holy Spirit comes into us and becomes a part of us. I mentioned earlier about sometimes whole families would bring their children to the church or to the parsonage on a whatever day of the week it might be to be baptized. And I remember one time that this had, had happened. A good friend of mine and his family, his, his sisters and brothers were baptized. And the words that the pastor said were something like this, that now that you have been baptized, now that the Holy Spirit has come into your lives, you will be able to more easily and more fully understand the love of God for you. And, you know, I thought about that statement, or just, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how he said it, you know, in the exact words, but now that you have been baptized, you will be able to more easily and more fully understand, you know, God's love for you. That, you know, it'll make a little bit more sense. We'll be able to be a little bit more accepting of God's grace that comes through Jesus Christ and through the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. In our first communion classes, sometimes there would be a question asking, the, you know, the kids would have to ask their parents some things. And one of the things that they were often to find out was, you know, when, when they were baptized. And after that assignment was given, the next couple days, the church phone would ring off the line Hey, hey, can you look up and tell me, you know, what day, you know, so-and-so was baptized? Because, you know, it isn't something that's on the forefront of our minds. You know, most times in the churches, they'll, you'll have a candle and you'll light and you'll give it to the child and you'll let your light so shine before others. They may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. And then they're in the box and on the box it's got the child's name, the church name, the baptism date, the sponsor's names. But those candles get put aside and put away and, and not remembered and not thought about. And so it's not always on the forefront of our minds. And I know when I was going to look up and find my baptismal date, my, my mom didn't remember that for sure. She said, well, I had too many kids to know all of those for sure that way. But to think about... God coming more fully into our lives. Our parents, our sponsors, and our church family. Because at a baptism, it's not just the people that are up front. But the whole church family is involved in this baptism and, and is asked, basically, do you intend as a congregation to continue to pray for this child? And one of the things that many of us congregations do is when our children reach a certain age, 
we, we present a Bible to them. And often it's got their name on the front of it. This is your Bible. And, and generally we try to get a Bible that, you know, it's not the old King James with the verily verilies and all those big fancy words that you don't know, but something that's more understandable for kids. Because that's what we need to, to do, is to come to God. And Jesus says that too. Unless you come to me as a little child, you can have no part of the kingdom of God. The children believe. I mean, that's, you know, when you tell, it's pretty easy to fool your kids for a while when they're young. You can tell them stories and they'll believe you. But they, they, they learn to trust their mom and their dad and the adults around them. And so Jesus is saying to them that, you know, unless even we as adults come with that childlike faith, that childlike openness to believe that God has created us, that God loves us, that God came to us in the waters of our baptism, that he came to us in, in the flesh of Jesus Christ. You know, we need to have that childlike trust and faith in that. Because if we start trying to use our logical mind in here, it doesn't make too much sense. And that's part of what has helped me in my wondering, why was Jesus baptized with the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Jesus came to that baptism because it was the, another stepping stone in his life as the Son of God living upon this earth. It was a time for him for affirmation from God, but not only for his affirmation from God, but for those who witnessed it. For those who heard this, this voice from heaven and saw this spirit descend upon Jesus and were then able to tell us about that and to say and to tell us, to write down for us that this voice says of Jesus, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say at baptism, listen to him, but he said that on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we listen to Jesus. We do as Jesus told us. And we trust Jesus when he says, your sins are forgiven. Let's pray. Gracious God, we often think of baptism as, as a simple ceremony for, for the youth of our congregations, for the youth of our communities. And we sometimes just kind of gloss over or don't, don't realize the, the importance of believing the words of believing that the words has a power and that at our baptism the Spirit of God becomes more fully into us and a part of us and often as adults we live each day most days often years at a time without thinking about our own baptism without reflecting that I am a baptized child of God it's one of those things that it's a defining moment in who we are as a child of yours. So help us to remember our baptism on occasion. Help us to think about that, maybe especially when we have Holy Communion, that because we are baptized, we can more fully understand and accept and believe that in the bread and wine, you come with love and grace and forgiveness, and that that's enough. And that you say to us each and every day, this is my child uh, whom I love, and whom I am well pleased. Help us to live lives that are pleasing to you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering plate remains in the entryway of the church. Uh, we'll sing our offering response, We give thee but thine own. We give thee but thine own. Whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. hymn we're seeing now is hymn number 770 I was there to hear your morning cry it's a hymn that we sing sometimes at baptisms and it's a reminder to us of how God walks with us all the way through our lives
was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you well. In a blaze of light you wandered off to find where demons dwell. When you heard the wonder of the word, I was there to cheer you on. You were raised to praise the someone to share your time and you join your hearts as one I'll be there to make your verses rhyme from dusk till rising sun in the middle ages of your life not too old no longer young I'll be there to guide you through the night, complete what I've begun. When the evening gently closes in, and you shut your weary eyes, I'll be there as I have always been, with just one more surprise. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I think that's just a beautiful beautiful song reminding us you know and it talks about all aspects of our life growing up running off to where demons dwell you know man that's living right i mean it's just life in, in itself and and then the verse of talking about finding our partner for life you know just you know, just beautiful words uh, reminders from god that he's been with us all of the time of our life and will continue to be that way um Let's bow our heads again and unite our hearts in a word of prayer. Gracious God, there is so much to pray for. There is so much unrest, mistrust, uneasiness in our country right now. There's just so much going on that is unsettling to our hearts unsettling to our minds, makes us wonder what the future will hold. So we pray, Lord God, for the United States of America, for the leaders that have been elected, that they may enact laws, that they may continue to, to follow the Constitution, that we may continue to be a constitutional republic, that we may be able to put our differences aside and that we may be able to work together for the good of all. That's what we are to do. We are to be a united people. So help us, Lord, as we transition in our country. I pray for all of those who work in the medical field and give thanks for the miracles of modern medicine, the different treatments they've been coming up with for cancer, for different things that cause so much pain for um, for people that just don't ever seem to have a healthy day. We pray, Lord, that, that the doctors, the nurses, the researchers would be able to find the proper drug, the proper medication, the proper treatment to bring them back to health. And I rejoice with, with so much of the modern miracles and, and uh, I just read this morning of, of, of a friend that 
uh, has been in the hospital in Texas and, and a new medication uh, that they've tried now have, have made such a drastic change in her life. So we rejoice, Lord, with that. And we pray that those who are suffering from cancer, from COVID, from so many different illnesses that impact us, that, that we would be able to find ways to bring peace and health and happiness back to them. Pray especially for Mandy and for her continued battle against her cancer that that these cells that she has now received will will do what they are designed to do and eradicate the cancer from her body. Pray for David and for Brock and just pray that the medication that they're on will continue to promote healing within them as well. We pray for ourselves, Lord, our families, that we may be united in love, that we may have the Christmas spirit live within us, that, that we would be filled with your grace. And especially we pray for our children as we bring them to the waters of baptism, as we bring them to, to Sunday school and to confirmation and place scriptures in their hands, that they would be open to your word. And we pray, Lord, for people that have never heard your word, that we would find missionaries that would be able to go out into the world and, and to translate the Bible into different languages and would be able to teach and reach more people with the loving grace that you sent to us so freely in your son, Jesus. We pray all of this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this day and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 721, and with one voice, Go, my children, with my blessing.
Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.